Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Time for Off the Press, where we check out the front pages of our national dailies. We do have Ezekiel Yaitok, who will make sense of all of the stories with us. He joins the conversation in no time. I start off with the leadership newspaper this morning. Now, let's find out what's on the leadership newspaper. The banner caption reads, COVID-19 amid Omicron concerns. Unvaccinated federal workers bad from office. Seek deadline extension. That's uh, the banner caption for the leadership this morning. You also have uh, riders. Exercise records poor compliance. Several MDAs deserted. Workers crowd vaccination centers. And federal government confirms three cases of Omicron variant. Niger once again vaccine equality at uh, the UN General Assembly. Uh, these are riders you find underneath the bold caption. Away from uh, COVID and Omicron uh, variant. You also find why bandits were declared terrorists. The Attorney General of the Federation is quoted on that. Kogi gives late Escott's family two houses. And you also have Fire Me Coker. Others decry worsening living condition. Nigeria, South Africa to strengthen ties. That's also another bold caption this morning on uh, the leadership newspaper. And uh, Senate cheats aviation ministry over Nigeria ego. That's the so much we can take at this point in time. All right, away from that, we'll move on to the daily independent the lead um, headline for this morning is uh, Death of Skewed Manpower May Delay Deployment of 5G. All right, uh, Customs Police Hurt Trade Facilitation at Ports and Borders Below that on the Red uh, Strip. Workers locked out as federal government begins vaccine mandate implementation. Buhari travels to Dubai to attend Expo 2020. All right, just uh, beside that to the right, APC, ADP, and nine other parties challenge Soludo's victory. Well, the rider, court dismisses suit seeking Soludo's removal as governor-elect. Death toll in Canaboat mishap rises to 29. Lawal wins independent Southwest Federal Lawmaker of the Year. Also on the Daily Independence this morning, above the masthead, NCDC confirms false cases of Omicron variant in Nigeria. What well, a right uh, there. All right, um, moving on. Uh, Saraki led Senate failed by confirming Malami as minister. That's according to Adiye. Says Ministry of Justice filled with incompetent lawyers. Those are the stories you can find on the front page of the Daily Independent. Away from the Daily Independent, let's check out the Daily Trust newspaper. And the bold caption says, COVID-19 Omicron, Buhari 10 ministers jet out to Dubai. How Nigeria dictated three cases. Ramaphosa visits successful despite scare. That's what the president is, said, uh, is quoted to say. Of course, uh, the president of South Africa visiting Nigeria. Federal government's directive flops as unvaccinated workers access offices and ignores emotion threatening national unity. Sol Tan is quoted. It's also now the caption you find on the Daily Trust this morning. Electoral Act, what will guide us in replying? Buhari's letter, Einek is quoted on that. And death toll in Kano boat tragedy rises to 29. ESWAP abducts six Borno officials. And despite receiving millions monthly, FCT Council Chair denies teachers' allowances. Uh, this is some of the headlines on the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. And finally, we head up to the Punch newspaper. Omicron is in the news as well. Omicron, Canada bars Nigerians' fear spreads as NCDC records three cases with several riders there. Variant detected in three persons with travel history to South Africa, says NCDC. Contact tracing never effective variant already in circulation, according to virologist 
Africa accounts for only 43% of COVID-19 global fatalities, states ECOWAS. Government bars on vaccinated civil servants, military issues, directive. On the blue strip there, resigned before December 18, fire me tells appointees nursing governorship ambition. Lagos hoodlums hawk NURTW bus at home shoot him dead in hospital. Or some sad story there. Uh, five or 6.9 billion naira fraud. Fire Shea's ally deposited 209 million naira cash for property, says witness. More stories on the punch this morning. 200 million naira needed to refit grounded Navy flagship, according to the NNS Aradu. Senate panels uh, fought invitation or aviation ministry over NG Eagle operating license. All right, Ramaphosa alleges discrimination in South Africa, others travel, or others rather, travel ban over Omicron. External reserves lost $610 million in November. CBN battles to save Naira. Those are the stories you can find on the Punch newspaper this Thursday morning. All right, let's have Ezekiel Yai to share his thoughts on the headlines. Good morning, Ezekiel Yai. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be with you. All right. Uh, we start off with the leadership newspaper this morning. And uh, on the leadership, the concerns of uh, Omicron uh, variant. And you also have the fact that unvaccinated federal workers barred from office and seek deadline extension. Let's share your thoughts on that. Yeah, there are several things to consider in that headline. The very first is our national position and what we should expect from the nationals, what we should expect from the citizens. And I cannot see anything short of confusion. We're just trying to see to what extent we should understand the body language, the statements, the actions of the federal government on this issue. Is it really expedient that at a time like this, when we are having a new variant come in, that rather than dig deep, set ourselves back and um, look at what we should do, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, with 10 ministers, are jetting out of the country for an expo. Where are our priorities? How do we really think as a government? That just gives the average Nigerian that, bros, leave that thing, you know, they're serious. If you're serious, or go for their house, maybe we see what to do. He's leaving the country, he's leaving with 10 ministers for an expo for a man that has less than two years in office. I think that this is a time for the president to embark on what he calls completion agenda, where he shot just some months back or some weeks back. He was going around the country looking for investors. Which investor is going to come to your country in a, in a country that didn't have succession and invest less than two years to your living office. I mean, who's going to do that? Who thinks that way? I mean, where, where are these guys coming from? Investors come to your country less than two years to the end of your tenure, knowing that whoever is going to come in is going to say, look, I don't know what you guys did. I, I need to look at everything, and I want to stand on a clean, clean slate. What you should do is what they call completion agenda which is what my state government is trying to do in a quiet bomb set, and I hope they are doing it right, where you sit down and you profile all your projects into three categories. You have the one that you call the necessities, that's the must do. You have the ones that are the general, which means that, well, and then you have the ones that maybe, maybe not. The first one is the legacy, rather, not, not necessity. You have the legacy, you have the necessity, you have the general. In the legacy, there are one or two things that you just think, this is my stamping ground, I'm really passionate about it. One, two, three things, you break the banks and you complete it, no matter what it is, because you are looking at the funds available to you. 
The necessities are things you must do. Salary is everything. The cost between the necessities and the legacy, when you put them together, if, for instance, your total budget is like 5 naira, and the two of them come to like 3.5 naira, then they now go into the last uh, bit and bring things that will come to that 1.2 naira, so that 1.5 naira, so that it makes a total you know, of the 5 naira. What that means is that the day you are finishing, you are going to finish strong because you have done due diligence, you've done what you call financial engineering, you've done everything. Then you now bring your team. That's why I like one of those places. You have a man, fire me, says, if you are one, if you are interested in 2023, please leave my office between, uh, between now and 18th of December because he wants to put in place what he calls a finishing team. This is what my president should be doing now. And not when you have this variant that is coming out and is likely to be more deadly. He's carrying 10 ministers, and we know how Nigerians operate. Lawless, with all due respect. With no regards. If at home they have no regards for guidelines, and uh, before you know, ministers are now the ones importing the new variant, variant into the country. Because we really know, we know it was discovered in South Africa. We don't really don't know where the source is. So I think that it is absolutely uh, 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 difficult, let me not use a very hard word, for me to understand and for Nigerians to understand why Mr. President thinks that this is the very best time to jet out for Expo with 10 ministers. That's the first thing. At the same time, you come back home and say, oh, if you're not vaccinated as federal workers, you're going to be back from office. You know, and, and they are like, what's really going on? But on the whole... One other report somewhere along the line says that Africa um, accounts for about 4.3%. Um, what that tells me is that there's the hand of divinity that has a major pushback. Because the way we, we operate, especially like in Nigeria, if there wasn't this hand of divinity that gives this pushback, I think that it would be a very sorry state or sorry, sorry story. Well, that's my take on the vaccination and our GAP president. All right, uh, let's um, slide over to the Daily Independent. Uh, their lead uh, headline this morning is, um, Death of a skilled manpower may delay deployment of 5G technology. You see, the 5G technology was also one that came with a lot of conspiracy theories and everything. And, um, you know, there's something that my... One of my in-laws used to say, in those days, there was a drink called Ovaltine. So when they say, the day is something, you don't drink over tea. The man say, I never drink tea. You they ask whether I don't drink over tea, you know? So we are talking of 5G technology. The 4G that we have already, to what extent have we fully utilized it? I know of all the benefits of the 5G and all that, you know, speed, capacity, capabilities, and all that, the sciences and the technologies that come with it, innovations. But I think that we are still in certain places uh, working on 2Gs. Remember when we were talking about this electoral act and the transmission, you know what the problem was? That in some places we have 2Gs. We don't even have 3Gs, not to talk of 4Gs. Now we are saying 5G. So... I don't know how that should make a bold headline. I don't know. I'm not a media person uh, in that sense. But um, I don't think that is, that is my headache right now. Uh, the 4G is able to do some of the things that we need to do. And when there was a bidding, only one company bidded for it. And then um, you can't have such monopoly. So I think that the other companies is not because they could not bid for it. I doubt that there's any of those other companies, the other big two or three that could not bid for it. I think they've just looked at the market, looked at the investment, looked at the infrastructure requirements, looked at the market, I say again, and discovered that that may not be a very, very sound investment. And they are not national, they are business. So the only is to look at the, the, the bottom line, the profit margin. And so long as they are not convinced, they're not gonna put their money there, especially when the federal government puts a lot of tariff or a lot of, um, you know, in the bidding process, it doesn't come cheap. So I think that that's the least of our problems. So we can move on. All right, let's check out the Daily uh, Trust newspaper this morning. Uh, on the Daily Trust, there are concerns from the Sultan that uh, ignorance, emotion threatening national unity. 
it's not ignorance, it's not emotions, it is politicians. When you come and sit down and look at the root of our problems, you will discover that it, it all goes back to politics. Nigerians don't really care about religion. They don't really care about tribes. That's the truth. Nigerians really couldn't care less where you come from and your religion. We don't. But politicians need a divide and rule approach for them to achieve what they want to achieve. Everything runs down to politics in Nigeria. And the day that we wake up and interrogate our recruitment process and have a different understanding. You know, for a while now, I've taken up that, um, that fight, one man battle on good governance in this country. I've gone around schools, I've gone around churches. Just um, last this weekend, the Redeem in a quiet section of it got all their youths and everything, and I spent hours with them, just enlightening them on politics. And I think we need to bring this conversation to the national level. We are sitting down here doing analysis of um, politics that has become, a, you know, commercialized. So governance is, is, is now a contract between willing buyers and willing sellers to, to entrepreneurs, so to speak, or, 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 or business people who come in, exchange the vote money on election day and the electionary processes for four years of them recovering their investment, making profit, and making more money to keep and give you another money during election period. That's what we have. In terms of governance, we've lost it completely. And I told people, government is your life. Put in an envelope and hand it over to a man. And I gave a, a certain illustration. This would have come and they tell you all sorts of stories. This man doesn't like you, that, that, that. What are they looking for? The responsibility is ours to do that due diligence because you carry a goat. You put glasses on the goat. You put face mask on the goat. You put a cap on the goat. You put a tie on the goat and a big jacket on it. And then you give it your raw yam to keep for you. A sane man does not eat raw yam. And you come back and the yam has been completely eaten and you're angry. Why? Because you didn't know that it wasn't a man. It was a goat that you gave your raw yam to eat, to keep. At the end of the day, the problem is not with the goats that ate your yam. It is with you that refuse to find out who you were giving your yam to keep. So the responsibility of doing due diligence is on Nigerians, on our leadership recruitment, because they own our lives, so to speak. So it is our responsibility, our duty to go and pull the glasses remove the mask, remove the cap, and see whether we are dealing with a man or we are dealing with a goat. For too long, we have brought people into office without doing due diligence on them. Who you are is who you will be when you get into office. 10 years back, what were you? 20 years back, what's your character? What's your capacity? What's your competence? See government as your life in an envelope. When we look at things that way, we will now refocus our leadership recruitment process and knowing that there's something at stake on the line. I think that when we put all these things together, we will be able to know what our national concerns are, whether it is ignorance, yes, to a great extent, or it is emotion. Emotion is inspired by something, which could be ignorance. So between ignorance and emotion, I think that Ignorance is one that they are using emotion to fuel our ignorance. So the time has come for us to wake up. I tend to agree with the Sultan that that ignorance is one of our biggest problems because emotion comes from you not knowing that, look, that guy is just trying to upset you so that he can leave and so he can take the whole thing. When you know that, if he tries to upset you, it's time for you to maintain your cool because you don't want to get upset and leave and then they take a decision behind you. So ignorance is fueling a lot of things. All right. Uh, staying with the Daily Independent, uh, there's a story there. Uh, customs police hurt trade facilitation at ports and borders. Your reaction, uh, Mr. Nyayutop? Yeah, customs police, they hurt trade facilitation at ports because trade facilitation is not why they are there for. They are there to see how they can make money. 
extortion, making life difficult, making the processes to be so cumbersome, making sure that things don't flow. And out of frustration, you call them and say, oh, God, beg, how do I do this? Oh, God, beg. You understand me? There must be a basis for negotiation. You can't beg a man to help you. Everything is moving seamlessly. At our port, our customs, our pleas, why are they there? What is their primary motive? What's their primary incentive? What do they want to achieve? It is not trade facilitation. It is rather exploitation. And this will come to an end when the man at the top thinks about the country, thinks about the essence of the office. When a man understands what the office is all about, a man who wants to get an office, get into an office today, a politician, you and I know their prime mentality. We know it. We know it. And we play the fool, and the fools end up playing us. I've contested twice for the governorship of my state. Why would I beg you to serve you? I'm not God. I come to you and I tell you this is what I want to do. And they said, oh God, this is not grammar. This is politics. You are speaking too much grammar. I said, look, governance is something that runs on informed knowledge. You say, oh God, that is God. We, this one is politics. Okay? Another man comes and says, oh boy, leave me. I talk. His grammar is too much. Guys, come, come, come. P.A. I beg give you money. They say, ah, you are a leader, you are a leader, you are a leader, you are a leader. They sing for him. They are happy with him. And he gives them peanuts. He gets their mandate. He gets to the seat. He's clueless on what the seat is all about. He has no understanding of the essence of governance. If you ask him, what is chapter 2, section 14, subsection 2B of the Constitution, which is the guiding principle, which is the, the what sets you out? Do you understand me? He has no clue. And he said, the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. And he just looks at you and like, bros, leave that thing. Did you understand that when you collected my money? Did you understand that when I have debt to pay? Did you understand that when you asked me to land? Did you ask me that when you asked for transport? Do you understand all those things? I beg, without saying it from his eyes, you can read that he's just... Leave it. He should get out. Let him make his money and leave. I think that the time has come where you and I really need to sit down and discover that the most blessed nation on earth, and I say that with, any, with every sense of responsibility, has become the poverty capital of the world. And the Bible says it's an error that princes are on foot and servants are on horseback. All right, let's also check out the Punch newspaper this morning and uh, the, the fact that uh, according to the CBN governor, Godwin Emefili, uh, we might probably just have to battle to save the Naira. Now, he says external reserve lost $610 million in November. Uh, that's according to the CBN. And, of course, there's a need to save the Naira. You see, um, I'm not an economist. I do not pretend to be one. I'm an architect. And um, I think within that sphere, I understand what I'm doing very well. But even as an architect, I do understand as somebody who wanted to be or who wants to be governor and still wants to be in government or govern, be a governor. I, I do understand that there is what they call division of labor. I believe that there is reason why you have a central bank. There's a reason why the central bank is expected to be autonomous. There's a reason where you have Ministry of Finance as different from the central bank. There's a reason why Ministry of Finance is under the presidency, whereas the central bank is an independent, autonomous body. Right now, I cannot draw a line between our monetary policies and our fiscal policies. I can't. I do not know who is handling what. I, the central bank gets into trade. They get into agriculture. They, get, they, they seem to be a mini government on their own. And as a result, when you go into areas that are not really your prime responsibility, what you start to have is a lot of 
conflicting flip-flop um, you know, policies. And unfortunately, foreign investment depends primarily on two things. One, the peace of the land. And second, the policies of the land. And when your policies are so inconsistent, today you are saying that the Naira should be short. We, we don't even know how you determine the value of the Naira. We don't even know the differential between that of the government and then the parallel market, which is almost 150 Naira. I don't see, they've not been able to give me the rationale behind that. And when you talk in terms of foreign reserves, it has to do with the amount of money you are using to shore up the Naira because you have given the Naira an artificial and not market-driven. You know, no, gov no country in the world allows some of the things to be you know, um, taken care of by the market forces alone. There's always strategic interventions. But let us see that, that your strategic in intervention is consistent, is informed. The American government recently released their, their petrol re reserve, okay? But you can see before it came, you can see where they are going, you can see why they are doing what they are doing, you can understand, you can project for how long it's going to be, and you can say, okay, for this period of time, maybe I'll play cool here because sooner or later it's going to stabilize and I can move on. In Nigeria, you can't. I'm a businessman, I can't plan. I don't understand what's going on. A lot of people, there's so much dollars in the houses of people because these were constantly mopping up the dollars because the organized private sector does not really know how to assess dollars. And there are some people that if you put a dollar at a thousand naira today, they will buy it. And they are buying it and they are hoarding it and they are putting it in their houses. What is the policy of the central bank to look into the concerns of these people, address those concerns, give them the confidence that they don't really need to store these dollars. So this is a constant mop-up of the dollars by people to store them. And for as long as the demand exceeds supply, the price will also always rise. And that will put a lot of pressure on you to be able to bring the dollars for the people that need it. So the policies need to be a lot more consistent and a lot more realistic and a lot more honest. I think that central bank is not um, is not helping us. I speak as a private citizen. All right, uh, staying with the punch um, newspaper. Another story there is um, stop irresponsible publicity stunts. Reveal your sponsors. Presidency tells Serap. <laughs> Presidency should sit down and listen to Serap. When Serap says something, let them say, Serap, you are wrong. And Serap is one body that the presidency should not even try to, 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 to fight them at all. Because they've become the one voice for the whole nation, Serap. They have this eagle eye on your budget. They say, sir, please explain this to me. You say you are being sponsored. I mean, it's cheap, man. It, it, the presidency has lost legitimacy or is fast losing. Let me not be too hard. And, you know, non-state actors are becoming better believed than our, 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 our own, you know, um, states, so to speak. One of my friends told me something. His father told him, never allow a man who is always trusted to lie against you. Never allow a man who is always trusted to lie against you. There's a flip side. Never make a man who is never trusted to be your spokesperson. Because even when he tells the truth, he says, here he goes again, and I lie, lie. You understand me? So I think that the federal government should not fight Sarah. Instead, they should look for strategic thinkers to engage them in a way that the public will say, okay, that makes sense. Instead of telling, reveal those why again, that's cheap. That is, that's lack of being cerebral. It, it's, it just bothers me. Sometimes I wish that I could just, I had enough time to go and say, government, let me consult for you small. When matters come, get five people into a room, 
let them tell you how to respond to matters. You can easily gain the confidence. Nigerians are the most trusting people in the whole world. And when you think all these bully methods and then um, go and see that, who is that? I mean, that is just cheap politics. It's not governance. Governance is for the cerebral. Governance is for people who are strategic thinkers. Governance is for people who are informed and have wisdom to know how to navigate the minds because the minds are always there. But you have this whole thing that politics is everything. Yeah, go and sit down, you're sponsored. Oh boy, who they sponsor you? That is that's that's garbage. That's motor. That's stout talk. And it's it's sad that government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, that boasts of the most intelligent people in the whole world, cannot assemble one, two, three, four people that helps them to respond to issues in a way that even even their enemies say, hey, oh, I don't want to try. That guy, that guy, that may make sense. I don't like him, but that makes sense. So they should leave Serap alone. Nigerians are clapping. Serap, please, that's my clap for you. <laughs> All right, let's also quickly share your thoughts on another issue on the Punch newspaper. He says, Senate panel falls aviation ministry over the Nigerian Eagle operating license. That's the NG Eagle. Is it the is it not Air Nigeria? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know much about it. Let me not just talk for talking stick. I don't. I don't. I don't know what's going on there. All right, uh, six point um, nine billion naira fraud. Fayoshi's ally deposited two hundred and nine million naira cash for property. That's according to a witness. The case is still ongoing in court. Yeah, a lot of properties are being uh, paid cash, you know, because of, um, you know, <laughs> more reasons than one. So uh, I, I think that it must have been a case of uh, maybe something gone wrong because before they are, they, are, they are exposed. And I don't know, I don't know, all those are private things. If done something wrong, let the, the law take its case, but it costs. But uh, for me, they say, how's the bunny, the pursue rat for Bush? They are more serious national issues in my opinion so whatever is the issue they should go sort it out mm -hmm. okay but let's also quickly share your thoughts uh, probably might not just be on uh, the dailies but the white paper that's been released uh, by the Lagos state government what are your thoughts on it and all of the uh, you know reactions that's trailing that white paper thank you i could speak a whole day on that that makes sense to me now governor Songolu is, um, you know, I said it before, last week or some two weeks back, Ambode was my schoolmate, Federal Government College Warri, and I think it was a year ahead of me, something like that. And um, when Songolu came and uh, removed Ambode, naturally, I wasn't too happy, like, um, because, but I want to say that this um, young man, so to speak, has um, impressed me in a lot of ways. On the white paper, I felt his pain. He's an APC member. APC government had come up and um, through the Minister of uh, Information, you know, tried to make nonsense of the panel. And then um, not long after, Festus Kiamo also came and said it was illegal panel. He said all sorts of things that whatever comes out to it was trash, was rubbish, was nonsense, and all those adjectives he used on them. And um, him coming to take a decision, he needed to navigate the minds. And I could feel his pain. And um, he tried, I would say, in first, admitting that the panel did work. Second, looking at some recommendations. Are they far-reaching? No, they are not. Do they address all the issues? No, they don't. And then even wanting to take a walk of freedom, declare, you know, a freedom square and things like that. I, I, I think that the case goes far beyond him. He, he's tried to navigate the minds. Because it's, it, don't forget, this is something that the, 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 the Minister of Information, the spokesperson of the government of the party that he belongs had said that this was arrant nonsense and bothered us. So I think that the lesson that we should learn from there is that 
as leaders, we must ask ourselves where our loyalties lie to our parties or to the people to which we swore to an oath to defend. The, the issue is not going to go away with a wave of their hand. And what I would say is that um, there has to be, instead of the work that he wants to have, he should call these people again to a second round. There was a white paper. There was a report. This is my side. This is your side. Can we come and have another set of, you know, discussion, so to speak? It may not be a panel this time, you know, but can we have, you know, like the people he called to come and take a walk with him? Can we come and sit down again and look at the recommendations, look at the observations? The panel can say, okay, or the people on behalf of the panel can say, okay, this actually makes sense. Then the government will say, yeah, I didn't also look at that. Because they can come and say, no, this one you said is not so. I think that there still needs to be that second engagement. You know, I think what the governor should have done, instead of thinking that we just take a walk, and when we take a walk, it ends there, he would have said, this was done. This is what we have noticed. But we want you to digest it. And then let's have another round of engagement. And then we'll be able to get something that's a lot more, you know, final. I think if you are taking that approach, uh, I'm not assuming that what he has done is just okay. But I think that I'll commend him for making the effort. He made the effort. And if you are, have an idea of the inside story, you would see that he had to withstand a lot of pressure and be himself and be his man mm. to be able to do what he did. But we knocked him. Yes. But, but we're talking about the fact that, you know, life's been lost, whether or not, um, you know, some parties will want to agree to that. There are a lot of evidence out there and you have a lot of persons who have lost their loved ones. Uh, you know, the pain up until this moment is that as much as that report has been commended, you still cannot, you still will find gray areas. Uh, for instance, where the bodies, where can we find these bodies? There also reports saying that, yes, there was a time where you had the military and the police trying to clean up all of the evidences and the blood quite early. Uh, it is really, really, I don't know how much of conversation and engagement would actually, uh, you know, mean justice, will bring justice. Uh, uh, of course, we know that these lives can never be restored, but uh, how much of the talks and conversation can we continue to have uh, so that the people would actually feel like some persons that are, are not being covered? Uh, those who have been, you know, pointed, those who have been uh, mentioned in that report, how come they have not been, you know, uh, some kind of questioning and what is really going on? But ho hopefully, we, we just hope, and we're hoping that maybe sometime, uh, maybe not now, there will be justice. I, I'll tell you this. Every issue has always been resolved on the round table. It's a global phenomenon. So you do not foreclose discussions. The first issue is that there was a white paper. No, there was a panel. Good. Second is that there was a white paper. Good. The third is that there has, since the white paper did not address it in a way that everybody is happy, there must be another line of engagement because at the end of the day, the government has to be exposed to the pains of the people and how to find justice to those that were hurt and that were killed. Lives can never be brought back, but there are certain things. Sometimes it may not even be compensation. It could just be acceptance and an apology, you know, because, I mean... And no punishment? No, yes, 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 yes. No, I'm, I'm yes. saying and no punishment. Because... No, 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 no. That, that's part of it. There has to be punishment. There has to be... There necessarily has to be punishment. But you see, when you look at tribunals, you look at... You no, know, as much as I didn't like what Festus Kiamo said, there are certain things that are law and you just can't jettison it. He said you cannot as a state summon or bring up any punitive measures on a federal controlled you know, um, um, state or 
persons or institutions. So I think it's the place for a tripartite dialogue now. Let the Attorney General of the Federation be brought in. Let Lagos State government facilitate it. Let the civil society be part of it. Let there be that tripartite arrangement where we look at apology, compensation, and punishment. So I'm agreeing with you. Some people need to be punished as deterrent because there are some overzealous, you know, uh, law enforcement officers. The police need to know that if somebody sends you to do what is wrong, when the die is cast, when push comes to shove, you're on your own. So they need to know what they should do, what they should not do, what they are mandated to do by the constitution and what they must never do on account of political pressure. So I agree with you, there must be apology, there must be compensation, and there must be punishment. punishment. That's, it's eight o'clock. That's my, my, my right. thinking on that. All right, thank you, Mr. Ezekiel Nya Etok. That's as much as we can take on this segment of the show. We must say we do appreciate your time and all that you have said so far today. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Have a nice day. You too. All right. It is still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. We'll take a quick break. We'll be having a security expert join us as we look at lawmakers asking police to dismantle illegal checkpoints in Nigeria. In a moment, don't go away. <laughs>